the Judeo-Christian ethic. Though God has not promised that we can significantly change our culture at large, as believers, we are to be faithful in demonstrating biblical values. Here's Dr. Gene Getz. Paul's letter to Philemon, and I think all of his letters that he wrote, really support this principle. We must never compromise. We must always be faithful in demonstrating our biblical values. However, as we've seen, we're to do that with great wisdom and great sensitivity. But at this point, um, before we look at that principle more in depth, uh, let's, let's look more carefully at Paul's specific request to Philemon. We've seen a general approach to that request, but this, this paragraph is classic. You're going to see that it even has some humor in it. And that, that humor, I think, will come out as we read it. So he said, Philemon, verse 17, if you consider me a partner, which I know that you do, <laughs> welcome him, that is the slave, Onesimus, as you would me. Now he's getting right to the heart of the issue. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And I think Paul did that tongue in cheek. Here's a very wealthy man, and Paul is saying, look, if he stole from you, I'll pay it back. And of course, Philemon would melt at that. I mean, he wouldn't expect Paul to do that. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. <laughs> and I think Paul was laughing when he wrote that. And I think Philemon was chagrined probably. He said, you wouldn't even be a believer if it weren't for me. And so you owe me everything. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, since I am confident of your obedience I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. If, if, if Philemon was on the defensive at this point, it would just melt away. Because Paul is simply saying, look, I know I've probably shocked you a little bit, but I know that you're even going to do more than, than what I say. Meanwhile, <laughs> look at this. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, <laughs> since I hope that through your prayers I'll be restored to you. I mean, that paragraph is filled with uh, sensitivity, but it's filled with the fact that he really knew Philemon well. They had a relationship, and uh, he, could, uh, he could be a bit humorous with the situation, because it really is reality. But he's dealing with reality that would, could be very threatening to Philemon when you consider all the circumstances. Now, we're not told what happened as a result of Paul's letter to Philemon. However, we can assume there was a positive response from Philemon and from his wife, who now is informed she's in the loop and then hopefully from the whole church. And as we um, said earlier, you see, this letter to Philemon set the stage for communication with the whole church, which Paul later wrote the letter to the Colossians. And imagine, too, what happened if Paul came to Colossae and stayed in Philemon's guest house. Think about the impact he would have had in that church. Imagine, too, how this whole situation may have impacted the master-slave relationships in the whole church, because Paul dealt with that, as we've seen in his letter, his general letter. I mean, this is happening in their, in the, before their very eyes. An incredible experience with a man who was a slave, who lied, cheated, stole, but came to Christ. His life has changed. He came back now as a brother and as a real servant and slave to Philemon, reflecting Jesus Christ, as if he was serving Jesus Christ. I think we can speculate that the Colossian church became a glowing example of Christ-like love and unity throughout that whole city. 
and maybe beyond to other places in the Roman world. Now, we also know from church history that the message of Christ's love virtually eliminated slavery in the church. How can you be one in Christ and be brothers and sisters in Christ and yet have this master-slave relationship that is cruel and that is authoritarian and that is, that is unfair? And when these slaves begin to serve their masters as they serve Christ, and when these masters begin to relate to their slaves as if they were brothers and sisters in Christ, what's going to happen? Functionally, relationally, it's going to destroy slavery. And it did. Now, the virtual, the, uh, the whole Roman world didn't change. They didn't give up slavery. Their whole economy, everything was based on it. It was a part of their culture. But there were churches throughout the Roman world that were demonstrating through even the master-slave relationships what it means to be one in Jesus Christ. So you can see the tremendous witness that these churches would have had in the Roman world. Final question for reflection response. In view of the fact that Western culture has to a great extent been based on the Judeo-Christian ethic leading to the proposition that all men are created equal. Why did slavery initially thrive in the West? And it did. And it's one of the sad chapters in our whole culture and our whole society leading to obviously the Civil War. But you see, even though our founding fathers were committed to biblical values, of the Bible, the Hebrew Christian ethic. They still misinterpreted Scripture because of bias. Or they made Scripture teach what they wanted to believe. And that can be true of all of us because bias and prejudice run so deep. And a lot of that happened in our, in our culture, even among some very brilliant people. But being brilliant doesn't mean you're not going to be prejudiced or biased. And we have a classic illustration of Peter in the New Testament, who God called to found the church. But as I've shared with you before, for five years, Peter didn't even believe Gentiles could be saved. After God had called him to be the great apostle, he didn't believe Gentiles could be saved. We know that's true because five years later, he got this invitation to go to Caesarea to a Gentile's house. And he saw this Gentile come to Christ with his whole household. And in the book of Acts, he is quoted by saying, I now know, after five years of having founded the church, I now know that God doesn't show favoritism. Which simply means that he believed God showed favoritism. Favoritism to only Jews. He wouldn't even initially didn't want to go into Cornelius' house because he was a Gentile. And he told him, he said, you know, it's not right for me, a Jew, to come into your house. Peter, this is five years after the church is born, where we're supposed to be one in Christ and you still won't go into a Gentile's house. But the Holy Spirit came on Cornelius, his whole household, they were saved. And Peter then went back to Jerusalem and reported that he had an incredible experience. And he reported this to the other apostles, and he reported to the, all the elders of the church. He said, men, women, God didn't show favoritism. Jesus Christ came to die for the whole world. And it doesn't matter whether you are a slave or you are free or you're male or you're female. We're all one in Jesus. And that was a lesson he had to learn. So when we understand the depth of prejudice, even within some of the very important leaders in the New Testament world, it's not too difficult to believe that our founding fathers who believed the Bible had bias in their thinking. Misinterpreted Scripture, or maybe, as I said earlier, interpreted Scripture to teach what they wanted to believe. And all of us, really, um, 
need to be careful of how bias or, pre- or prejudice can become a part of our lives and we won't even see it. We don't want to see it. But God has a way of breaking through. And we see it beautifully illustrated in Paul's letter to Philemon. And then later, his letter to the Colossians.